you know, and before it starts to get really physical. And so my whole point about podcasts and why I think it's so interesting for the future is everything now is a knee jerk thing. It's 140 characters. It's, it's everything is so fast. I mean, I still think there's a place to have a conversation well, with somebody. Uh, let me tell you, man, that's always been my philosophy as that in this day and age, as you point out, of 140 characters, hot takes, split screen arguments that have hashtag battles and things like that, that nothing trumps a good conversation. It really does. You know, and look, I, I know I'm, I'm doing a sports talk radio show. I'm on a hundred some odd uh, sports talk radio affiliates coast to coast. And I have a lot of people who are sitting in the seat in which you're currently sitting right here on this set who are quote unquote celebrities, right? From I've been fortunate to have movie stars, TV people, and other people who are uh, up and coming actors and actresses and whomever. And I think having good conversations with them, even though it's not about what's going on with the left fielder in this situation, why mm -hmm. is this quarterback struggling? You know, it's a conversation about fandom and about pop culture. If the conversation is good, I want to have it, and I think people are up for listening to that as opposed to an argument where there's no gray area. There's no nuance anymore, and that's part of the reason why I didn't want to do sports anymore, Peter, is that towards the end of my tenure at ESPN, it was no longer a show about what happened in sports. It was all about why something happened in sports because you were already assumed to have seen what happened yeah. or learned about what happened, that you're coming to Sports Center to find out why something happened. And in order to make sure that the viewer is serviced about why something happened, the analyst is forced to take a position and then sometimes to make sure that that position is um, in some way, shape, or form more crisp They'll have another person on to have the exact opposite yeah. position. And then my role sometimes, as a host was now a crossfire role, and that's not why I got into sometimes, sports center. Sometimes people will have opinions that they don't really feel. I mean, that they don't really believe and, in. And that's why I, and it's I, madness. And, and that's part of the reason why when I was first given an opportunity to have a show like this one, again, the, 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 the TV radio simulcast, is I did pause for a second because I don't I – don't, Stri it doesn't strike me that um, when I'm asked about what I do for a living, opinionator is not one of the first things that leaps right. to mind. And I understand that that's the currency of sports talk radio. So when I have a take or an opinion, it it's what I believe. I'm never going to manufacture. I just can't do it. I won't do it. I don't want to do it. That's not the way I want to be paid. That's not what I want to you know, get through the day. I always thought it was amazing that newspaper columnists, I mean, let's say – Dick Young, back when you probably he'd have been on part in the inter well, not part in the part in the interruption. I think is an outlier in the in, in right. A great it is, version. but I mean, he'd have been on the around the, the, the horn, around the horn. But <laughs> my Dick point, Young. people who don't but know, he Dick told Young, people to go f off. <laughs> Dick Young was this sports columnist in New York that when I was growing up, he was. I don't know, probably 65 by then, but he was famous for a long time. But I couldn't believe it when I would read the papers. As a young kid, I could not believe how every day he had a strong opinion about something. Well, I know. That's impossible. How can you have a really – you wake up on Tuesday and you say, I have a strong opinion about this in the NFL. I, I could see having one or two a week, but every day? You could say he was the Skip Bayless before there was a Skip that's Bayless. That's a very hey, good I know point. A lot, I know a lot of diehard Seaver fans that think he ran him out of town. Dick yeah. Young ran Tom yeah. Seaver out of town. But, you know – that's why, though, like I said, you know, I will always have an opinion on something that matters to me or that I truly believe. I'll never try and force it. Uh, but the reason why I am doing a show like I am doing is, you know, I've done the suited and booted thing on Sports Center. Game day morning, I love. I love the guys that I do game day morning with. I consider them all great friends. Like I, I know, I know them. They know me. Uh, Michael Irvin was at my baby naming and my wedding. Mariucci's red green eggs and ham to my children. Marshall Falk is known as Uncle Marshall in my household. I mean, for real, love these guys. Love what I do, and I do love uh, the old school sort of highlight driven. Uh, host, traffic cop-driven type show. But I also want to do a show where I can have conversations like what we're having right now. I mean, you did three segments on my show today, you know, and that's that's part of the reason why I love having a three-hour show 
Whereas normally, though, Drew Brees comes on my show and I have to have him on the phone or maybe I get him for just 10 minutes in a sit down one on one. A podcast, he understands we're going to get into more stuff. It's going to be leisurely. I've got 30 yeah. minutes, 40 minutes, and it's more laid back. And the thing I also love about a show like the one that I'm doing and also with you podcasting, you have the best of both worlds in, in this day and age. And by that, I mean this. You are part of a live TV broadcast with NBC. Mm-hmm. And that is also DVR proof type broadcast. Okay. You need, when you're doing your stuff on NBC, it's live, it's current, people have to watch it, it's DVR proof, which is what you want in the 21st century. But you also, in the 21st century, need something on demand. This podcast is somebody that will just, okay, I saw this podcast from Peter King. I love listening to it every week. I'm going to put it on my phone. I've got a train ride coming up later today. I've got a plane ride coming up two, three days from now. Got to have that. Got to have that. You got to have on demand. And if you're lucky enough to have DVR proof broadcasting, got to have that too. I'm lucky enough to have it. You're lucky enough to have it. And that's, that's what you need. Another thing I would tell kids in the 21st century is trying to have a little bit of both. The on demand is the way it's going. The show, like I said, the Rich Eisen show is available on the NFL Now app. There's more, this is, you know, we're on the campus of DirecTV, but you see the AT&T symbols everywhere. People are going to be watching stuff on their phones or their tablets or taking it and putting it towards their television by connecting it. You know, that's the way this, this world's going. So have, having this and being able to have a good conversation at the same time, I, you can't beat it. Can't beat it. This is the MMQB podcast. Movement Watches was founded on the belief that style shouldn't break the bank. Their goal is to change the way consumers think about fashion by offering high-quality, minimalist products at revolutionary prices. With over 500,000 watches sold to customers in 160-plus countries around the world, Movement Watches has solidified itself as the world's fastest-growing watch company. Movement Watches start at just $95. If you are going to buy a watch at a department store, you're looking to spend at least 400 to 500 bucks. You see, Movement figured out that by selling online, they were able to cut out the middleman and retail markup, providing the best possible price. Now, here's the best part get 15% off today with free shipping and free returns by going to mvmtwatches.com slash mmqb. That's mvmtwatches.com dot com slash mmqb you know what i love about these watches such a clean design i love simple watch faces and anybody will tell you once you put one of these watches on you will be getting compliments all day long now is the time to step up your watch game go to movementwatches.com slash mmqb that's mvmt watches dot com slash mmqb join the movement with rich eisen on the mmqb podcast with peter king so let's get into a few football things sure. but first i've always wanted to ask people who do this show i always ask them what's your favorite interview of all time oh wow jeez <sighs> man um Gosh, what's my favorite interview that I've ever conducted? I don't know if I have a favorite. You know, we've had, I've I had Jim Brown here for a whole hour. That was incredible. You know, one that you were kind enough actually to point out in, in your column, uh, Gil Garcetti was sitting in that seat when the whole OJ documentary hoopla was going on and having a full-on conversation with a man who was right in the middle of something so important to our culture and so important to our country what was going on in our world to be able to sit down with him and have a full-on conversation with him I mean my day I graduated from Northwestern was the day of the OJ high-speed chase wow I remember exactly where I was I was at a post Northwestern graduation party at at a restaurant in Chicago where I was excited to be in this restaurant because the Knicks we're playing the Houston, Rockets yeah. in a, a big, huge NBA Finals game, and I'm a big Knicks fan from New York or before the Knicks you know, went in a different direction. But to be able to sit here with Gil Garcetti and have a full-on conversation about that, 
was really awesome. I mean, Mike Tyson's been on this show. Celebrity-wise, Brian Cranston and Matt Damon. I loved having those guys on. Matt McConaughey is a big Redskins fan. I enjoyed that. Will Ferrell. Um, you know. I'll tell you one interview that was really good, and it's the only time I've ever heard you. I thought you were going to genuflect. And that was a... Vin Scully. Yeah. I mean, I mean, your Vin right. Scully interview was really, really fun. Thanks. It was very educational. And the reason why I thought it was educational is that you allowed him to tell stories. Well, I mean, I'm I'm not doing my job if you don't have the greatest storyteller, perhaps, of our profession ever tell the stories. Hey, Vin, listen to me talk. You know, <laughs> that's part of the way that I view my role, right, is that my job is to draw something out of an interview subject or let the person speak. I don't need – I'm not doing this to let you know how much I know. I'm doing this to let you know how much the interview subject knows. And I want storytelling. John Miller came in here from the Giants. Spectacular. And I love when I see on Twitter and people react to these interviews saying, I never knew that guy was so funny and so personable. Yeah. You know, getting, I, I wanted to make sure John Miller told the stories about uh, uh, you know, a couple of things. Number one, Vince Scully. Do his Vince Scully impersonation. Got to have, make sure he did that. And he did it in Japanese off the top of his head. <laughs> Couldn't have been funnier. <laughs> You got to seek that one out. It couldn't have been funnier. As well as, you know, I was in the, uh, I, I w- was working uh, um, at Sports Center when John was, you know, uh, calling games for ESPN on Sunday Night Baseball. And um, this is my favorite uh, story, John Miller, that when I got to call baseball games, very rarely did I get out of the Sports Center studio to do this. Um, so I got to call my first ever baseball game. Which turned out to be, God bless it, San Diego versus the Expos in San Diego, where it was scoreless through nine. Wow. Yeah. Scoreless through nine. And Ryan Klesko with a base hit in the 10th finally ended it. So there was a lot of tap dancing that I needed to do. But I, before it, I called up uh, John. And I'm like, look, John, I'd love to pick your brain. He said, no problem. So here's the scoop. When I'm telling a story and balls hit, let's say the ball then hits the bag, pops up in the air, a triple play starts. Like, what do I do about my story? Like, do I stop? And he goes, here's what I tell people about this. You're telling a story to your friend. The most beautiful woman in the world walks in. What do you do? You and your friend look at the beautiful woman. You stop telling the story. Nobody bats an eyelash. It's no big deal. You just tell, just stop, recognize the woman in the room, go back to telling the story. I'm like, totally get it. Totally understand. <laughs> Cut to about 12 years later. My wife calls me up. A friend of hers from New York. Um, this is about five years ago, says, how would you like to have dinner tonight with us and Donald Trump? Now, I grew up in New York City. I know exactly who Donald Trump was. This is before all the politics. And I'm like, yeah, absolutely. I'll have dinner with Donald Trump. No question about it. There we are at dinner. Donald Trump is telling one of his million stories about his beautiful acreage and his golf course and all his business. And he's telling the story. And right behind me and my wife and everybody else, some six foot four brunette walks in the room. <laughs> And he goes, wow, stops telling the story. She's beautiful. We all looked at her, then looked back at him. He finished his story. (laughs) (laughs) Just the way John Miller said. I've never seen it put into real-time practice before. (laughs) And it was Donald Trump is the one who did it. And I I told John when he was here, I'm like, John, you're right. We what was an eyelash. what was dinner with Donald Trump like? Uh, it was him talking about his uh, seriously his beautiful golf course, his beautiful this, his beautiful that. It was everything that you would expect it to be. I thought it and would be a lot more about football. No, he's I mean, a huge he didn't football know, no, guy. I know too. he is, but no, he really didn't bring that up much because I think he, might, he knew I might bring up the three dollar check that the USFL <laughs> got back in the day. But you know. Um, at any rate, the uh, reason why I brought all that up is just it's my job to let the storytellers tell, tell the, the story. Stories. Yeah, so yeah. I appreciate you saying that about the Ben interview, though. We're with Rich Eisen in Los Angeles. It's the MMQB podcast with Peter King. A few minutes left. Uh, so, Rich, what do you think is the most significant or troubling aspect of the NFL that the league needs to get on top of so that you make sure that moms 5 and 10 and 15 years from now will let their kids play football? Well, obviously, making sure that the game is as safe as possible, that's number one. And then number two, I just think it's an overarching sensibility that comes from the league 
ownership and everybody that they understand what the fan wants and that they truly are about making sure it's not 